Hi, welcome to the Sifu Mimi Chan Show. Thanks for joining the conversation. Hello, hello. Welcome to another solo podcast episode. Hopefully you guys are enjoying these and please feel free to give me feedback if you are not or if you have questions. So I found that a lot of times I get listener questions but also Kung Fu student questions and I don't always have time to go into depth with those answers and many people have suggested that perhaps I continue to do these solo podcasts so that I can go a little bit more in depth, share some stories and insights, and hopefully don't come across too lecture-y. So I start to go into Kung Fu teacher mode when I start talking about Kung Fu things um, versus the podcast mode where I'm just curious and a really great listener. So these solo podcasts can get out of hand please let me know if they start to, but I'd love some feedback and I'd love some more questions. So if you have them, please submit them as I am definitely going to be trying to throw these into the rotation so that we have a little bit of variety. A lot of you have expressed the desire to hear more about the martial arts journey, to hear more about martial arts philosophy. So hopefully these will be of interest to you. All right, well today I thought I would tackle one of the most common uh, martial artist questions I get, whether it be from students myself that I teach at the school or other students from the different schools we have throughout the Wallum system, or back when I used to be a, a, a tournament judge, I would go around to uh, different tournaments, I would judge. A lot of times the competitors would come up and ask, you know, what they could improve on and sometimes they would even ask like how can i improve what was what was that turning point for you and one of the things that i always reference is literally a very very specific summer in my life it was the summer of 94 actually i think it was the summer of 94 but but basically for me one of the things that i recall if if you all have seen Quick plug, Pui Chan Kung Fu Pioneer in the documentary, you'll notice that I talk about how I didn't love Kung Fu when I was younger. I didn't really feel like it was something I was passionate about, but something that I was forced to do. And just really, it was just kind of part of my daily routine, part of my life, what I did. I woke up, I went to school, I went to Kung Fu. Now it's pretty much rinse and repeat. And so it took me a while before I found that appreciation. And I've spoken about it on this podcast. I've spoken about it before on the fact that I finally recognized how unique of a position and how grateful I should be that this world-renowned Kung Fu master that people traveled all around the world to come and be with uh, was my father and my teacher. But I think I've, I've not really gone into depth about that transition, that light switch for me or that light bulb, have you, where um, what actually took place in, in order for that to transpire. So literally it did feel like one minute my kung fu was very mediocre and very much lackluster in terms of the effort i put in and how i performed and i didn't really compete a lot at that time um probably before i was 15 and just you know here and there and you know i was because of the number of years of experience i had i was always at an advantage whether competing as a 12 year old or a 13 year old, I was already then 10 plus years in experience compared to other practitioners. So in terms of tournaments, I fared well, right? I, I always quote unquote won, but it really doesn't mean that looking back, I would be proud of those performances. So when I get asked like, how did I improve? Uh, my first answer is still working on it, <laughs> hoping to get there, hoping to improve, as we get older, we get pulled in multiple directions. We get we get distracted, right? And so we're not able to necessarily put enough priority and attention on ourselves, no excuses. But as a teacher, your job is to give. Your job is to help others and enrich their lives and bring them um, on that journey, whether it be for the physical aspects, whether it be for the mental and emotional aspects of balancing out who you are. And um, that's a whole nother podcast, but I always talk about the fact that 
once I made that revelation, so I think I talked about it on my last podcast of of hearing the story of someone who traveled all the way from South Africa to be with my father, I thought, wow, I need to put more effort into this. I need to actually, you know, basically kick my own ass. And so my father was always my teacher, but he never really over pushed me. And I think it's because he didn't want to push me completely away. I've heard him tell other Kung Fu and not just Walam, but other grandmasters who would say, how did you get Mimi to love Kung Fu? How did you get her involved? And you're so lucky. And I think he did find this balance between making sure it was part of my routine, making sure that it was something I had to do, but at the same time, not driving me so hard that I hated it so much. As soon as I turned 18, I was like, I'm out, I'm gone, never doing this stuff again, which you see a lot in uh, Asian American AAPI culture where whether they own a restaurant or a business or their family are all doctors, et cetera, et cetera, you get pushed so far away from what your family line is doing. You just, you want to deviate and do anything else. And so I think I was fortunate that whether by great leadership, whether by good parenting, whether, you know, that my parents made sure I did it, but but it wasn't so much to the fact that he would wake me up at the crack of dawn and train me for eight hours a day like they would in China. However, they did threaten to send me to China when I was like eight or nine years old. And when I say they, my dad wanted to send me to train with the um, head coach, uh, Wu Bin, and his team for the Beijing Wushu team, who is the person who was the coach at the time for like Jet Li and so many others. and one of the coaches there, she took to me and my dad thought it would be a good idea for me to go live in China for a year. And my mom said, absolutely not. So that got next. But uh, the point being, I decided there was something I needed to do. And what that meant was I needed to practice, right? So it seemed very, very obvious that in order to improve, one needs to practice. And there were upcoming tournaments in my life at that time as I transitioned like 15, 16, I was like, okay, I think I think this is a time in my life where I wanna work harder and I want to improve and not embarrass my family too badly. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of take it more seriously. And so I came up with my own schedule. I would, I had decided to spend the summer training at the temple. And I, I do wanna say it was like the summer of 94 or something like that. And I decided I would wake up, I would go to the temple and I would just spend at least an hour doing the Kung Fu warmups and basics. And so I focused a lot of my time on just doing the basics. And as a competitor, people would say, oh, you know, you do all these fancy moves, you can do butterfly kicks and splits and all this other stuff. And, you know, do you practice that stuff all the time? And ironically, that summer, I literally went there every day and I spent all that time really focusing on, on what I teach now every Monday night in my Kung Fu advanced class are those basics and doing my stances and doing the kicks and just doing the basic warm ups and just kind of absorbing and just being in the temple you know, lighting those incense at the start of the training session, having gratitude and being present and aware of where I was and what I was going to do, and then just taking the time to love the fundamentals and the basics. And I think that just cannot be understated or underestimated and how essential that was in the progress that was my my literal day and night of kung fu performance. I actually remember, you know, right before that summer, we had a show or something and, you know, I did my form and it was okay, whatever. And then after that summer, we had some grand opening events up north. We also had some tournaments and literally all of my kung fu peers, my kung fu brothers, and at the time, Kung Fu sisters and my, you know, people that were in the system just asked my parents, like, what happened? Who is this person? And it's not that I was like this amazing Kung Fu practitioner all of a sudden, but you could see like the spark. So it wasn't just the spirit, 
but you could see that there was some work that had been done. And so because I had a foundation, I've been doing this thing for 15 years of my life and, and, and every day, even though I didn't do it well, it was there, right? It was kind of like dormant. And then just me hyper-focusing on those basics just allowed me to then strengthen my performance, strengthen all of the complicated moves, being able to transition from uh, a, an average practitioner to a undefeated, grand champion of Kung Fu, right? And so it it wasn't anything fancy. It wasn't a secret formula. It was literally just spending a whole summer doing my basics. And then throughout that next year of high school, I would even wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning sometimes to just get to the temple and do those basics before school. I was very dedicated to making sure that I had time to do those fundamentals. So whatever you do in life, I when people ask for my opinion, I say, just go back to the ABCs. And I would guess that as an artist or a writer or an athlete, there are some, you know, musician, you have scales, like those are the things that will really take you to a higher level. So it's kind of knowing your basics at an advanced level. So oftentimes in my advanced class, I will spend 45 minutes to maybe the whole class doing the basics. And I feel like sometimes that can be very quote unquote boring for students, but at the same time, I hope that I can articulate how important it is and also that the student or practitioner can then appreciate what we're doing even though the movements are familiar, even though the movements are the same that I've been doing for X, Y, Z years, I've been at the school for blah, 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 that it becomes something new. Right, I, I am not a great meditator. I, I, I know that's like, you're not even supposed to grade your meditation level, but I've never found the higher plane. I, I don't transcend and I often get very antsy and I, I know that the point of meditation is the act of trying to do it, not trying to do it perfectly or having some sort of achievement. I mean, I'm sure there is some level of, oh, you know, meditate for an hour and my mind is so clear, but I think it's just the act of it, right? And so the same can be said for your martial arts training. It's just a matter of like having that intention and putting all your energy towards doing and attempting to kind of get it done right. So for me, that summer of basics was the game changer. And I would urge anyone um, to explore that and kind of let me know what that means for you because really rediscovering the basics, rediscovering your fundamentals truly is what growth I think is about. And I, and I don't want to get too meta or anything, but I feel like as a person, that's also the case, right? And so as I've become a social justice warrior or activist, uh, somebody who has been fighting for a lot of different communities that are marginalized or for causes that I really believe in. As you know, I've been working on the AAPI history bill. I have been speaking out for abortion access and reproductive rights. I was so privileged to partake in an incredible um, protest and moment and rally in Orlando with Representative Anna Eskamani, who, you know, led this charge. And, and I feel like the fundamentals of who you are always has to be explored because we can kind of look at ourselves at different moments in time and like rediscover that. Like, who am I as a person? What was I taught growing up? I was taught to be kind. I, you know, I had a, a religious upbringing, which, you know, I don't necessarily follow now, but I do know that kindness to your neighbor, right? Be good to your, to one another, uh, <laughs> respect. <laughs> the teachings of Kung Fu at my school, which is to learn kindness and fellowship and hard work, to respect and to have control, all of those things are the fundamentals of who I am, right? So I think re-exploring that as well is a practice that we have to do in order to kind of touch base with ourselves and to constantly improve as humans. 10, 15 years ago, I I was, I didn't consider myself an activist. I, I felt something about a lot of the causes. I had opinions, but I didn't act on them. I didn't do anything. I didn't take action. And I'm not saying that everybody should or has to, but I feel like when Oscar and I talk to people who are training and they are maybe complaining about not progressing 
or complaining about not getting the results they want, you know, the question we ask is, well, what are you doing and how is it working for you? And nine times out of 10, we're not really doing what is leading us to our goal, right? And I feel like the answer is too easy that you should just go back to the basics and go back to the fundamentals and kind of dig deeper into that, into that um, trench of knowledge that's already there and then build on that. So for me as a Kung Fu practitioner, as a martial artist, going into my basics at 16 and just spending the whole summer dedicating and sweating in the temple was what elevated my Kung Fu. Am I where I want to be? Absolutely not. But I'm, I've also directed an award-winning film. I've also ended up, you know, social uh, justice warrior and, 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 and fighting and working on causes I really believe in. I run the Wallum system. There are a lot of other things. I'm not the best martial artist in the world. And that has come at a cost of be, me being able to multitask and do other things and have a balance. And I have to be okay with that balance, right? So my fundamental of who I am, I have to keep revisiting to see if that, that, you know, where does that balance lie? Do I feel good about it? Do I feel positive? And I think as humans, it's something that maybe we don't, we don't consider as much in such a formulaic way, right? So for me, when people ask, how did your Kung Fu get better? How are you an quote unquote undefeated grand champion? It sounds so, uh, to say that, I, I always get a little bit embarrassed as my students just went through tournament training. A lot of them will be competing for the first time very soon in a couple of weeks by the time this airs. Hopefully they did well, it, they, it would be over. But I don't really have uh, stories for them on my great defeat and my comeback because I've honestly always been able to fare well in competition and come out on top, but by no means does that make me the best of anything, right? For me, that summer of basics and fundamentals, working on that and having that light switch and literally physically being able to see that change, you know, that was a success. That was my gold medal. That for me was um, everything in terms of my martial arts training. So first it's the realization of what I have, having gratitude, understanding that I had this rare opportunity, and then it's the action of taking that gratitude and opportunity and doing something with it, revisiting the fundamentals, doing my basics and improving. And then, you know, in the next phase, it becomes refinement and, and so on and so on. And then at some point I need to once again sit and be grateful and think about all the things that I've been able to accomplish, but because of why, like who has helped me with that? What what has what has kind of made all of that possible and then i go back to my fundamentals revisit that and so on right so i feel like it's this cycle but instead of getting bored with the basics i think we can constantly be rediscovering that and what that means uh and that kind of goes into the next question that my father got asked so he is world renowned for his splits jumping in and out of splits if you watch the movie you'll see a lot of footage of him jumping in and out of splits i think dr paul kwan talks about it that you know that was his signature move he'd get the chairs out back in the 70s before you saw that probably a lot of times in other areas and he would he would demonstrate like this is important flexibility and and having mobility and you know you're uh, you're kissing your toe and all of these things that now in fitness it's so interesting to see Oscar's videos and hey we're doing this um, you know side lunging which is like kung fu side to side it's like all these moves that are being rebranded in different names and it doesn't matter there's no first there's no I am the originator of anything but you know my father definitively had a lot of flair for performing but also movement in um just flexibility and strength with his tom tui which is the you know the single leg or a pistol as fitness people call it so what was really fascinating was um you know just being able to kind of see him perform do those splits that was his signature move so a lot of people always ask him about like how do you get more flexible how do i improve this and we were at a Kung Fu seminar. I don't remember what the seminar was, but it, we used to have them in the park. And in the park in Florida, it's always warm and it's, but it's, but generally in the fall, it's not as bad. And we would, we would do the seminar. Everybody would wake up. The Tai Chi people would do their Tai Chi in the park and the Kung Fu people would wield weapons in the park, uh, Kung Fu weapons, of course. And then after that, we'd have a big picnic where we'd all eat. And then there would be the anniversary cake. And then the big present comes out 
out that we present to Grandmaster Chan and, and, and Master Susie Chan and thank them for, uh, for bringing Walam to the world. And so that usually is an anniversary. And we were at this event and I remember he, you know, he blows out the candles from 12 feet away, which I think now he can only do four to six. So he feels like he's getting older, but it would be, you know, this remarkable thing where we'd light the candles and he'd back away from the table and then he would, he would blow the candles and they'd always go out and it was a huge ordeal and everybody was very excited. And then he had a Q and A after this one particular anniversary event where he blows out the candles, we're all eating cake and he got up on the picnic tables into like a perfect squat because that's what he would, you know, wash clothes in. That's the position he would chop onions in. He would bring his cutting board down to the, the tree stump and, and he would be in a perfect squat all the time. So he was always practicing his squat, right? And I think someone asked him like, well, how do you improve knee pain? Because my knees hurt me all the time. And my father is not a scientific professional or anything, but he was in his squat and goes, just do this all the time. and. I mean, it, it kind of is the answer, right? Like if you're able to do that, then that means all this stuff around your knee and your leg is strong and you probably won't have pain. So it's just funny how intuitive something like a master of martial arts has, even if the scientific like explanation isn't there. And so he would just say very simply, you should be able to do this, which is a squat. And then someone would say, how can I improve my splits? I want my splits to be better. That was the next question. And then he, he sat there for like, you know, five seconds and just thought about it. And he goes, practice the splits. <laughs> so, so a lot of times we're seeking this complex answer or this, you know, long breakdown and explanation or when really the answer is really simple. And I think deep down, we all know the answer, whether it's with, whether it's on the fitness side or the martial training side, like we kind of know the answer of what we need to do. And this kind of goes back to the fundamentals and the basics and kind of embracing that simplicity of training and the simplicity in the answer that we need to find for ourselves is usually there. And I feel like we just, we as humans just make things a lot more complicated. I am the number one person to make things more complicated. <laughs> so I am equally as guilty as people, maybe the um, uh, audience that you're listening to this. I am not speaking from a high chair looking down upon you saying and judging you. I am literally talking from experience that I will overcomplicate and um, make things very difficult. I, I'll give you kind of a fun, personal story actually. So I am known to my family members and some of that know me as a little bit of um, obsessive compulsive. And so ever so often I like to redesign my room. I would like to like move my furniture around, make things more space efficient, make things a lot more, I wanna be able to stretch at night or I wanna be able to do like my little fitness routine. This is back when I lived with my parents and I only had my room, that was my domain and that was my space. And so Oscar and I were dating at the time and he was visiting and hanging out and I said, look, I'm gonna need you to move furniture. I need to rework this space. I feel like, I feel like I'm not maximizing, meaning I feel like there needs to be more room. So he's like, sure, all right, let me know, I'm here. Let me know what you need to, to kind of move. I'm, I'm, you know, 18 year old young Sean Oscar, however old he was at the time, was ready to move stuff. And I'm like, okay, just hold on one second. You know, and I got my pen and my measuring tape and literally like 30 to 40 minutes later, while he was napping on the floor, I kind of mapped everything out and took measurements of everything. I said, okay, I'm ready to go. I've got the measurements. I know what, I, know we're gonna move. And he goes, okay, what do we need to move? And you know, I had my bed and like, like a nightstand and literally it was like the nightstand just had to move over like six inches because I had already maximized the space in that room and there wasn't really a lot to do. And I totally could have just moved that nightstand myself, but there you have it. I overcomplicate things so, and overanalyze things and question myself, right? And so like, I should have just known however I had it the first time was probably right because I usually try to get it right that first time. But we we definitely have a tendency as humans, I think, to overcomplicate things and especially me. So, so yeah. And, you know, kind of in closing, one of the, one of my favorite stories that 
that kind of encompass that whole fundamentals of who we are. So I talked a lot about the philosophy at the Kung Fu School, and so you probably won't be able to see that well. Those of you listening, that's great. I don't have a picture of it, but this is our Kung Fu book, and here's the page that talks about our altar, you know, our martial arts altar. A lot of you have watched Kung Fu Pod. You'll see it behind me. I do a lot of talks on it, and we talk about the, you know, honoring our style, honoring our ancestors who are on, on the altar, and it's it's really just about respect. And so it's to respect, and then it's to learn that kindness and fellowship and hard work, and then that middle sign, um, which is actually right here, conveniently on my shirt for the Control Your Health logo, that, that upside down fire sign, which so many people are fascinated by, the Fo Ji Do Jun, which is um, the literally the character for fire in Chinese turned upside down. And many people walk into the Kung Fu school who read Chinese and politely, sometimes not so politely, try to correct us and tell us, hey, the, the sign for fire is upside down. And we're like, we know. So this symbol is very specific to my father's village in Shaojiang. This is not, um, just a martial code. This isn't, I mean, other martial arts masters have come and asked about this. So this is not something that is anything outside of specifically to my father's village and to his style and to our particular martial arts altar. And they believe taking that fire, the sign for fire and literally it turning upside down is extinguishing fire. So it's taking it and, and bringing in that control and patience so like your anger or you're going to extinguish it any anything that's inflamed or you know the the tendency to lash out like you're gonna it's patience it's control it's it's um it's it's centering yourself right and so I feel like that is something I have always had trouble with because I very much want things to be efficient effective now I want to get it done and that really applied to my kung fu training as well I it took me a long time to learn the butterfly kick, which literally I think I had to put my 10,000 hours in and I feel like I finally, at my peak of physicality, had gotten it to where it was, it was like my signature move. And But I, I, I don't really love and embrace the fundamental of, hey, this is gonna take a long time. I, I'm very much, I want this done right away. And so that's always been something kind of difficult for me to grasp. and. When I was young, um, very much the same personality. I wouldn't say young Mimi was that different. Uh, she was just shorter, much, much shorter, and um, with pigtails. So <laughs> really, really the, my personality has been pretty consistent from what people tell me. And one, one thing that really resonates is that when I was maybe eight or nine or something like that, one of the things I loved was fruit and I still do love fruit. And my father was very, very excited about a tree he was planting. And I was in the house and he ran inside and he said, come outside really quick, come outside right now. Oh my gosh, you're gonna be so excited. Star fruit tree, star fruit tree. And this is all in Chinese, so I'm not sure how the translation comes across, but he was super excited. I'm like, oh my I go outside, it's so hot, let me put my shoes on. I come running outside and he's like, look at this tree, you're gonna be so excited. Look at all the, you're gonna have this star fruit. And I looked and I'm looking for a tree. And then I look down and literally there's this plant in the ground, like a stem with a couple leaves. And he goes, there's a star fruit tree. And I'm like, that's the star fruit tree? Where's the star fruit? I wanna eat the star fruit now. And he goes, just you wait. In maybe 10, 12 years, you're gonna be really happy. You're gonna have so much star fruit. And I was deflated. <laughs> so as you can imagine, the I want it now, you know, child of uh, born in born in the USA, drive through now, uh, did not really take to that wait 10 to 12 years thing. And I'll never forget it because I was so excited and ready to eat it now, but then I was so angry and I was so impatient and I was like mad that he dragged me outside in the heat to show me this little leaf, you know? And and it really represents, I think, <laughs> a turning, a, a, an opportunity to reflect because this here is a star fruit and it's a smaller star fruit, but 
literally not 12 years later this is now we're going on probably 30 years later this tree gives us so much star fruit every year that we have to give it away that we have to share it that we have to freeze it i make star fruit jam i make uh star fruit everything now so this tree is so fruitful and i just had to be patient you know i just had to be patient in order to to reap the benefits of what you sow and i think there was just something super super meaningful and gosh insightful in that lesson but i had to wait a long time to learn the lesson and i think this parallel is really great to the fundamentals of who we are being a martial artist that things can't come quickly things take a long time and we need to be patient we need to have the control we need to have that patience and the foji dojun right we need to have that in order to progress and hopefully this hasn't come across as a lecture in any way but just wanted to share some stories in kind of that journey for me of not necessarily like exactly what kicks and what punches I did to improve as a martial artist, but I very much see that journey of becoming a martial artist and becoming a person and trying to be a good person as the same, like being a good martial artist and being a good human, social justice warrior, all the things that I try to do, you know, teacher, sifu of my students, right? All of those things to me are the same. So like all these lines of who I am converge into one and and it's taken a really long time and I feel like it's gonna continue to take a really long time to get to where I wanna be. But I am slowly but surely learning that patience and that control and to embrace the fundamentals and the basics and continue to improve them. So that is my story for today. Hopefully it answers your question, those who were asking about how my personal improvement went and hopefully it was entertaining. You got a little window into uh, who I am and what it was like for me growing up, especially with uh, my father, Grandmaster Chan. A lot of people always have questions about that. So send me more questions and let me know if you're enjoying these solo podcasts. I uh, honestly like having guests because I just get to ask questions and let them go. And I just, right now I'm sitting here in our in our home gym and just kind of getting a bit of a stretch but talking to all of you and this is fun too but it's a bit different so please give me encouragement if you're liking this and i will see you next time bye that's all for today's episode thanks for listening to the sifu mimi chan show you can become a patron of the show at patreon.com slash sifu mimi chan to help keep this podcast going follow me and interact on social media at Sifu Mimi Chan on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook.